I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about SVGs, dropdowns, and HTML5 form elements. Let's check it out. First up is spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, this is the best show on YouTube. Spoiler alert. Basically, this is a jQuery plugin that will blur elements on your page that you pick. And if you go ahead and click on those blurred elements, you can reveal them completely. So this is something that works on text, it works on images, and it's really easy to add into your site. And it looks like there's compatibility currently on Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. If we go ahead and head over to GitHub, you can go ahead and download the code there. And to go ahead and use it, you just add this spoiler alert to your, your JavaScript. This would be really useful if you were creating a, a website with, uh, with Mad Libs in it, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't want to know, you, you know. You don't want to know too much. You, you don't want to give too much away. Don't want to reveal it. Um, this, you know, would also be good on like a, a video game review or movie review website where, you know, you might have spoilers in the review and you don't want to reveal them. So I think it's a pretty cool way to do it. Um, and technologically, this uses uh, CSS filters to go ahead and blur the text and images, which is why it doesn't quite work on Internet Explorer. Oh, or... spoiler alert, it doesn't work on Internet Explorer. Surprise. That was actually a true statement. Yep. All right. <laughs> uh, I guess we can go ahead and move on. Let's move on. Next up, we have a project called SVG.js. This is a lightweight SVG animation and manipulation library. As you would expect, it supports a ton of different plugin options, and it is, of course, very easy to use. If you click the See It in Action button, you can see a ton of different options that they have on the site here. And as I scroll down, you can see the different things that the SVG.js plugin does. So um, it's, it's a little bit hard to see as we're scrolling down here, but if you go towards the bottom, you can see the different animations that they do, and isn't that just... Just craziness, animating, moving, sizing, rotating, and skewing these different SVGs. So there is a really, uh, really great um, page for it over on GitHub. The plugin page for it shows all the different options that it has. And as you would expect, it supports a ton of different options, checks for SVG support, and there's really just way too much to go over on this show. But if you want to check this out, we'll have a link to it in the show notes on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash GoTreeHouse. Check it out. Next up is this really amazing blog post about Amazon's mega drop-down menu. So, you know, when you go to amazon.com, you go over to the left side, and they have this huge drop-down menu that basically breaks down all the different sections of the site. Now, prior to this blog post, I hadn't really thought a whole lot about this. It just kind of worked and yeah. I thought it was very straightforward and just used HTML and CSS, possibly some JavaScript. But it's actually much more complex than that. In this blog post, they first say that you can go ahead and scroll to the different elements or different departments here and it switches between each one pretty quickly. Now, if you look at your more traditional drop-down menu, um, this is a drop down from Khan Academy. This one is from Bootstrap. You'll notice that there is a delay. Now you need that delay there to make sure that when you scroll over to the next menu, uh, you know, it doesn't disappear. And as you can see in this example from Bootstrap, you have this kind of maddening situation where there's no delay there and the menu disappears before you can go ahead and click on it. So how are they doing this then on Amazon? They're, they're scrolling through here and they're changing the menus very quickly with no delay. And yet when you scroll over to the right side, there's, uh, there's no issue. Well, they're actually using some pretty complicated uh, trigonometry maths. and maths uh, basically to triangulate where your cursor is going to move next. So if you're hovered over one of these 
items, it creates this little triangle where your, your mouse can actually go to. And so even if you hover over other departments in the list here, it will not switch to them because it's anticipating that you're actually going to go over to the menu on the right. So pretty amazing post, definitely worth checking out and definitely worth uh, possibly implementing on your own site because uh, the, the gentleman that wrote this article, Ben here, was nice enough to create a jQuery plugin that will actually go ahead and do this for you. So pretty amazing stuff, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty deep web programming there. Yeah, that, uh, that's really awesome. It's something that I never thought about either. Even having implemented drop downs myself, it can actually be a bit of a maddening process. Yeah, they're, they actually end up being really complicated for some reason. So um, this is pretty amazing and provides really good usability. Yeah, definitely check that out. Cool. Next up, we have a website called How to Lose Weight in the Browser. And there is a wonderful illustration on this site. Uh, now, what this site goes over is all of the different best practices that you have for slimming down your web pages. Things like minifying your CSS and JavaScript, where to place them in the browser for more speed. Because uh, as I think we've gone over before on this show, the speed of your web pages is very important from a user experience point of view. If your site is slow loading, your users might go ahead and disappear. So uh, they have a ton, just an absolute ton of different best practices on the site. It goes over what to do with your HTML, your CSS, JavaScript, jQuery images, and even on your server. So we've talked about most of these best practices here on the show before. Um, things like using minifying your CSS. They even talk about minifying your HTML. Now, browsers don't care if your HTML is nice looking and well indented. So there are tools that you can use to take all the line breaks out of your HTML and slim that down because every single little bit helps when you're going on, you know, to display your web pages. That's interesting because I've heard about minifying JavaScript and CSS. I don't think I've heard anybody minifying HTML. So uh, that makes sense. Yeah, that, and they even point to um, a tool that you can use. Uh, and it goes so far as even, you know, putting your uh, style sheets on the top and then JavaScript on the bottom. Uh, there's actually way too much to go over here on the show, but you can check this out at browserdiet.com. That's, is... that's very cool stuff. I mean, uh, you know, front end performance is one of the areas where you can actually make the most performance gains because, you know, you can have better hardware, you can certainly optimize. Uh, your database schema or SQL queries on the back end, but front end performance ends up being a lot of the load time, and it's the area where you can usually see the quickest wins in terms of performance. So yeah, yeah, and it's a it's a very deep rabbit hole. Yes, it is. There's there's lots and lots of tips and best practices you can dig into there. So Nick, uh, on that note, I feel like this show gets a little bit serious sometimes. Um, it it does. You wanna yeah. wanna maybe take a little break and, and relax with Zach. I think so. I'm starting to feel a little bit stressed out. Let's relax. Treehouse lullabies in spring. I feel I feel much better now, Jason. I didn't blink once. I feel like we really we really needed that. Yeah, nice little break. All right, cool. Next up is Preboot, which is basically the precursor to Bootstrap, which is the popular CSS or front-end framework from Twitter that we've talked about maybe once or twice on this show or a million times. <laughs> Preboot is a collection of less mix-ins and variables that allow you to write CSS a lot more effectively. There's a lot to go over here in Preboot, so I'm just going to go ahead and give you a small example here uh, using colors. 
So they suggest that you can actually go ahead and compute your colors using these uh, less mix-ins and variables. So for example, if you had a black color here, you could go ahead and darken it, and then you could just use in your code something like black 90 or black 20, etc. And they also give an example where you could keep your brand colors consistent by using these variables here where you say, you know, primary success, warning, and then you use those in your code instead of using actual hexadecimal values which can get copied and pasted everywhere and then, right. you know, you could have slight inconsistencies and then if you want to change a color, it gets really crazy. So with this, you can go ahead and just change it all in one place. But um, pretty cool stuff. Definitely worth checking out. There's a lot to, to dig into here. Yeah, I guess you would use this if you don't have the need for like the full bootstrap suite. Yeah. Or, you know, even if you just want to learn and see how it works. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely worth checking out if you're just starting to learn this stuff. Next up, the HTML5 doctor is back in with a blog post on the HTML5 form input types that you're going to be seeing uh, a lot more lately. So this is a, a pretty great list um, of all the different new input types that we have available. There's search, email, URL, date ranges, date times, colors. And then they also go through and show how each of these different input fields work. Now, why are you going to want to use HTML5 inputs as opposed to just regular inputs and then, you know, parsing that logic server side? Well, with HTML5 inputs, you get certain helpers on different devices. You know, the web is moving to phones and tablets and all that, and it's something that you need to pay attention to. So as an example that they have here, if you look at the um, email form input helper, then if you use the email input, on the iPhone, it will actually give you a different keyboard. And the same thing is true for telephone numbers and URLs. Here's a good example of the telephone input field on both iPhone and Android devices. You get just a number keypad instead of the usual um, text input. So this is a great blog post to go through and just kind of get a refresher, get up to date about the new HTML5 form elements that we have access to. That's that's very cool stuff. I, I remember, you know, in years past, so many people have been waiting for these HTML5 form elements to really come of age. So it's exciting to see new development, look, yeah. new developments like this. So, and actually be able to use them. Yeah, seriously. So next up is this really cool icon set or this really cool icon font called Genericons or Genericons. We've talked about font icon or icon fonts on the show before. Basically, it's a vector icon font that you can embed as a web font, and it will allow you to go ahead and use all these various icons on your site. Now, the cool thing about using an icon font is that the file sizes are generally very small, and they're all vector-based, which means, according to this site, you can use genericons for instant high DPI to change icon colors on the fly, or even with CSS effects such as drop-down shadows or gradients. I was really hoping it would rhyme for the third <laughs> verse there, but... Uh, Maybe we but, can get Zach to come up with a rhyme for that. But that's okay. I mean, on that note, you know, I'd give this site, you know, four out of five stars for not uh, not actually rhyming there. But uh, actually, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, you have all of your typical icons here, like uh, Facebook and Twitter, GitHub, um, LinkedIn, Pinterest... So, overall, I'd say this is very, very Pinteresting. I see what you did there. It's a word I'm trying to make happen. Nice. Very uh, Pinteresting. Got P it. Pinteresting. Next up, we have a site called DevRef. This is a small collection of utilities that you might find useful while you're developing your different websites. So, this has things like a base64 decoder, URL decoders and encoders. Um, decimal and hexadecimal and binary converters, a header analyzer, uh, just kind of really small but useful tools that you might need when developing a website. Uh, an example is a, a tag stripper. So if you have an HTML tag in here, strong, you know, strong, hello. 
you can hit submit and then it just gives you the text without the different tags. So a bunch of different utilities that you can try out and that's over at devref.com. That's, uh, that's about all I got for this week. Who are you on Twitter, Nick? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. If you like this show, go ahead and check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gotreehouse. Over there, you'll find show notes and links and more. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Interesting. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.